And I will start with a little introduction of about five minutes, um, telling you what the framing of this debate actually is. And then I will uh, start with about uh, the, the seven, eight minutes introductions from our two speakers who will not have any academic presentations, so no PowerPoints. We will just do this in a dialogue form. I used to be a, a, a political um, journalist, and therefore I prefer more that kind of discussion than based on long, powerful, uh, or not powerful, or whatever, <laughs> PowerPoint presentations. Anyway, um, let me start by saying the following. As, as humans, of course, we tell each other stories. And storytelling can either be for entertainment or for education. But in a very important way, that, a very important thing that we do storytelling for is to actually convince somebody else of our views, of our point of view, and of our reality, or change maybe the view of that person in question that we're talking to. And of course, this is called politics. And all stories have some truth, and all stories also have some fiction. But more importantly, the question is, which story can be trusted? And there we come, of course, uh, especially this is for academics, on the field of Gramsci, who famously introduced this, uh, this, to this topic of hegemonic. When is a story hegemonic? When does it become, in a way, so powerful that everybody believes it, that everybody goes for it, and sometimes it might actually have a big influence on the way we, or politicians, come up with ways of uh, changing society. Now, I will start by reminding us of some of the Western or Northern stories that we tell each other very, very quickly, just to remind ourselves of it. Capitalists, big finance, most economists will say the following, the following story, economic growth is fantastic, it's good, it solves all societal problems. So what we need in order to deal with all the problems that we have now, inequality, climate, etc., etc., more economic growth, and that's it. But of course, this growth uses a lot of resources, comes with a lot of externalities, and the degrowth thinkers will say, hey, la la, this doesn't, this doesn't sound very right. They come up with a kind of a strategy of plant reduction, of consumption, of production, etc., etc. And then you will have green growth fans who will tell you, yeah, but the energy crisis is not that serious, you know, we can deal with it. We can have 100% renewables that can replace our current fossil fuel energy system easily and things solved. Climate activists, on the other hand, of course, are less optimistic. Greta will tell us our house is on fire. So that's another very powerful story. And where are trade unions in that? Well, trade unions, we all know the most important thing they will tell you is that there are no jobs on a dead planet, which means they have certainly recognized the importance, the urgency of the topics that we're dealing with. And they have come up with the just transition um, uh, concept, which of course is we need to decarbonize our social economic system, but we need to do it in a just and fair way. But what does that mean, just? That's the question. Not everybody and not every country has the same historical responsibilities in terms of how we are dealing with our planet. One of the biggest questions, of course, is who is responsible for the climate emergency, for the biodiversity crisis, and therefore who will carry the heaviest burden. In the last five to 10 years, we can see that the narrative in this area has very much shifted. About five, 10 years ago, certainly on a diplomatic level, international level, it was all about common but differentiated responsibilities, very legalistic uh, and not always very easy to understand, even for the diplomats sometimes, and lots of controversy around it, of course. Now there has been a new narrative that this narrative has changed a bit to global social justice which looks a bit more at the historical and colonial roots also of Western modernism and of Western economic progress. And even the last IPCC report, which came out in April, um, has now, is now talking about, is recognizing even for the first time, 
with the word colonialism, that colonialism has increased the vulnerability of people and of places on the global scale. Now, how do just transition narrative and the global climate justice narrative relate to each other? I think that's the main topic that we want to discuss here today. And we're going to listen now, after having listened to my short uh, northern stories, we're going to listen to stories more from the global south, because the narratives that they tell there are probably quite different from the narratives that we use here in the West. So we're going to do this, as I said, with a panel of very diverse uh, background. We have, I will introduce them in a way one by one and give them about five to seven to eight minutes uh, intervention. Then after the round that we've had with two of our speakers here and two online, we will have them respond to each other. I might have, and Kalina will, will help me with that, might have one or two follow-up questions. And then I hope we will still have at least half an hour of discussion with people from the uh, audience, either online or uh, in physical media presence. So for all those who would be online and like to um, have questions, they have questions, I suppose they have to do it in the Q&A. No, not in the chat. OK, is that uh, correct? Yes, that's correct. So questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, please. All right. Um, let me start then now with the first speaker. That's Isadora. She's on the left here to me. Isadora Cardoso Vasconcelos. She describes herself on her website as a queer activist and specialist in climate and international intersectional justice. And she is actually a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam in Germany. So Isadora, seven, eight minutes for you to start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I can hear it myself as well. I will just bring the microphone a little bit here. And um, first, I'd like to um, thank um, the organization of the event for this very wonderful conference and also uh, discussion. I've, um, I've been working with the issue of climate justice more broadly uh, for some years now. And it's really interesting also to, um, for the first time, uh, being able to speak on the relations of just transition, which is a new topic of my research for myself um, and climate justice. And so I am very excited about it and also to be here in person with you. Um, I yeah, so I'm going to address some few points, not necessarily um, on narratives or um, um, or global self perspectives, but mostly uh, on some some things and principles that uh, that I think that I've been researching and also seeing the literature, especially from civil society actors working on just transition on how it should be implemented if it is to be just as it says in the name. So um, I think that it's important to 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 say that a just transition it's is not about uh, has to transform not only um, the sources of energy that we are using to power our economies, um, but more fundamentally and structurally the unfair working conditions that um, that actually sustain our economies. And so, and this is a feminist demand that I, I think was addressed in the earlier panel on care um, and work. I unfortunately couldn't attend it, but um, but it's 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 a demand that not only if we don't transform the unjust, the unhealthy, and the unpaid working conditions that actually sustain the whole economic system that we're living we're living in, we can change from one from from one energy source and from one type of uh, production to another, but still keep the same exploitative relations with each other in our uh, society in our societies for example, within the families, but also uh, within workers and um, employers, or also with humans and nature. So if we don't transform fundamentally those exploitative extractivist ways of relating, uh, which are also very binary, um, I think we are actually going to, we're not going to have any just outcomes out of, the, of this energy transition. Um, secondly, and so, and also still on this point, um, uh, feminist just transition does is committed to 
to this transformation in their relationships and fundamental, fundamentally um, in which um, in a way that work the, the invisibilized and not the invisible because we have been talking about the unpaid work and it's it cannot be invisible anymore it, it is forced to be invisibilized still by uh, the hegemonic forces i would say um and so um tr having to address and have and giving the the fair compensation for the unpaid and the care work that mostly women and girls of color in the global south or from the global south perform still in the global north let's say it is a change a fundamental change that we have to have in our uh, working relations that will uh, definitely contribute to a to a more fair uh, transition in our um, for example in the in the energy sector but also more broadly in other sectors um, and so um, this is uh, this is a a principle that fe that feminist just transition has very very importantly, and a third a third point would be that uh, as you said the the ones and the countries not only the countries but um, the the sectors or the companies that have his historically contributed most uh, for the emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, they have to indeed uh, they have the moral responsibility to end their fossil fuel produ production first um, but not at the expenses of um, exploiting or still um, relying on cheap labor and poor regulations that are in the global south for example and so um, um, also not by allowing that the free market uh, will reign this transition uh, from dirty energy sources to green to uh, sustainable sources of energy. So basically, um, there has to be this global uh, this global perspective of and how things are interconnected uh, from global north to global south. Um, also, uh, just transition has to take into account. Um, the, the globalized nature of our sector, as I already said, um, we are not going to achieve just transition um, in Germany, for example, or in Belgium or in the EU, in, in, the, in the territories of the global north. Um, if, um, if, 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 for example, the dirty, the coal mines are shut down here, but still uh, Germany, for example, is importing coal from, from Colombia. And so it's it's not uh, this this kind of relationships relationships have to be broken, and they have to uh, also be I mean, and putting the responsibility of the all the actors involved. We know that it's not as simple as like Germany or the EU are the only responsibles in this sum, but of course this dependency and neo colonial ways of uh, of uh, the of the markets that we have in general they have to also be transformed. Um, as Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So um, it's just that we cannot safely secure that the transition here or the fossil fuel phase out in, in the EU will be achieved by some deadline while still relying on, on poor conditions of work and exploitation of nature in, in the South. Um, that's basically what I wanted to address for the moment, and I look forward to um, hearing more in your comments. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Isadora. I think you have been uh, very, very good at sticking to your time uh, slot, so uh, thanks thanks for that. And you've mentioned, I think, some of the really important issue in, in the debate. Um, one of the things that, that, that I, I, I would like to have answered later, uh, and therefore it's a question now that I just throw in and think about it, and we can come back to it later, is that um, I think there has been an acknowledgement that the global south has to have a bigger voice in our planetary crisis. On the other hand, if you look at the uh, different uh, diplomatic um, uh, levels where the discussion is taking place, I have the impression that both sides are actually not coming cl closer together, but, but are really diverging more and more, which I think is very, very unfortunate. But we can come back to that later. Um, let me introduce now on my left side also 
Birsha Odeda, who is Indian, who is a lecturer from climate change, environmental law, also at the SOAS in, in London. He works especially on human rights, on water law, and uh, he has also done a lot of work on, on climate litigation. So for seven, eight minutes, uh, Birsha, you have the floor. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Woody. Um, so I, I guess I'll be, in a sense, building on what my previous, um, what the previous speaker, uh, Isadora Hordy, kind of um, has laid out. Uh, Willie also, in his introduction, has touched on. So I'll just make a, a few brief points. Um, I guess, firstly, in terms of just transition, what is just transition? What is climate justice? Um, what are the intersections? Um, just transition, you know, at, at its very basic, uh, is the insistence that workers and marginalized don't bear the the costs of the transition to a decarbonized future. Um, and, and climate justice is kind of a more overarching concept that I, that's how I would see it. Um, it's a term that's been deployed at different levels to achieve a human-centered approach to safeguarding uh, um, uh, the most vulnerable from the burdens of climate change. Um, uh, broadly speaking, at the international level, as Willie has said, it's been um, kind of enshrined through common but differentiated responsibility that the least developed and developing countries are not taking the lead in terms of mitigation, uh, are not paying for adaptation, um, uh, or not having to pay an overbearing cost for the adaptation that, that has to occur, or loss and damage, we can come back to that. Um, uh, so in a sense, these, these terms are very much interlinked, but, um, but sometimes we're not thinking of them interlinked because just transition is sometimes looked at very nationally. Um, and energy-related transitions, um, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a social or, or more social or more ecological transition. Uh, for instance, the rapid deployment of battery technology of um, renewables involves large amounts of mining of co um, of lithium, cobalt, and other sort of rare earths from primarily from the global south. Um, so just transition and climate justice have to some, somehow come together in terms of our thinking. Um, uh, so for instance, when we're talking about European green transitions and so on, um, the suppliers, uh, the, the, we need to think about where those extract, where that extractive resources are going to come to finance or to uh, deploy the energy that, um, that is demanded in the north. Um, the, so this comes up, I guess, uh, in terms of a broader conversation is necessary as a saying around just transitions. And here I sort of borrow the words from uh, Professor John Barry, um, who says that the just transition cannot be the decarbonization of capitalism without with trade union input in a sense that while trade unions have um, been, uh, you know, been involved with the discussion around just transition, if it isn't a more radical um, conception of just transition, which is looking away from uh, further extractive um, policies or further sort of uh, uh, further ex exploitation from the global south, um, and continues along a green growth strategy, um, all you're going to get is the same sorts of exploitation in, that we've had in a sort of carbon fossil fueled world. Um, at, at a national level, um, without having any bigger form of climate justice, and all the trade unions can uh, will be doing is just uh, having some input into that green growth strategy. Um, so that was the first point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make was more on on law, which is which obviously what I teach in my background, um, <clears throat> and what what law can do or what can't what it can't do in a sense. Um, climate. Climate justice and just transition at the international level have been talked about for a while. Um, climate justice in particular, as I said, since 1992, the common but differentiated responsibility, which has been sort of enshrined into international treaties and so on. Just transition more recently in Glasgow and, um, and the previous COP, there were political declarations around just transition. The ILO has also obviously published um, guidelines and so on. So there's a sense of some pledges uh, around these things, around political declarations and so on. Um, but what's missing sometimes is the actual action on it. Um, so in terms of climate justice, the biggest kind of missing elephant in the room is climate finance. Um, even just a few weeks ago in Bonn or last week in Bonn, this was the um, this was again the big issue. Um, the, the, the sense of um, climate finance that should be flowing from the north to the south just hasn't happened. Um, $100 billion was pledged in 2008 or 2009. 
Um, that just hasn't, $100 billion a year was meant to be mobilized essentially. Um, by 2020, that hasn't been met. Um, further scale up hasn't happened. There's just more diplomatic pressure, more watering down of these kind of pledges. Um, and that's at the international level. At the national level, in terms of just transition, it's even more lacking um, as, as I see it. Uh, so while there have been some uh, movements in the global north, for instance, Scotland has recently enshrined uh, just transition principles into its climate, um, climate uh, laws. Canada is speaking about it. EU has its own sort of funding mechanism. Uh, the, more broadly, it's still quite, uh, lacking a lot. So in the global south, if you look at India, for example, um, India announced a net zero um, target by 2070, uh, which means a, a decommissioning of coal or a, a move away from coal. Millions of people depend on coal. And I'm sure the next uh, uh, sort of another speaker on this panel will speak on this as well in terms of the coal dependency in India. Um, and how people are dependent on coal in terms of coal mining, transport workers, power industry, uh, <clears throat> various associated industries that are there. Some of them are organized into unions, but most of them are not because of the nature of the economy that relies on informal work. Um, so for this coal transition, there needs to be a lot of planning, a lot of, um, a lot of legal work to be done, a lot of policy guidance, a lot of organizing and so on, and that has been lacking to date. Um, so the decommissioning of coal plants, etc., environmental remediation um, has been lacking and the only pushes have been through um, litigation in a sense. Um, and then the other one is around finance at this kind of national level. Um, so I talked a little bit about the international level at the national level. Um, uh, it's about trying to link what mechanisms there may be, I think, to the international level. So in the Indian example, for instance, there are certain funds like uh, that are there in terms of using money that's made from uh, uh, extractive practices like coal to put back into communities and so on. Uh, whether that can be done in a way which links to international money that might be coming in or hasn't to date, but might come in in the future. Um, might be one of the challenge, but also in terms of that, uh, how does that money get spent? Who makes the decisions around how that gets spent? Uh, is it just the same politicians and, and people that are uh, embedded in the carbon economy, or is there a role for communities uh, and, and unions and so on to make a, make, uh, take action? My final point, sorry if that's kind of scattered a little bit, um, but my final point is just, again, building on law in terms of litigation. Um, so. Fossil, uh, sorry, just transition litigation is a, is a key topic around the world, in a sense. Um, recently, there was a paper um, that was released by uh, some authors from uh, Joanna Setzer and Annalisa Savaresi, who work very closely on, um, just on climate litigation. And they identified just transition litigation around the world as one of the growing areas of, um, of, of, of climate litigation. What types of litigation do you see? For instance, you see um, indigenous people in Mexico bringing a case against uh, EDF, uh, the French um, power uh, company, about wind farms being built without consent of indigenous people. So you see these kind of, uh, the, apart from the move away from fossil fuels, the growth of renewables bringing new tensions, new conflicts, new, um, new areas of litigation. In India, you see this with land litigation around solar, um, solar power plants. Solar requires a lot of land. India has a renewables target of 450 megawatts uh, by 2030, very ambitious um, plans, which requires a lot of land, which requires, um, which essentially involves um, the state acting as a land broker and essentially taking the land from people and giving it to pri primarily private sector <coughs> participants um, to grow uh, to make these um, renewable energy plants. Uh, that creates huge issues around livelihoods because a lot of that land is used for farming and so on, uh, basic livelihood activities, land rights are quite messy, um, and so on. So these kind of issues um, create uh, are increasingly litigated and how they're litigated is very interesting because sometimes courts, judges, lawyers, etc., see renewable energy, see the positivity messages around green growth and so on, and are willing to sort of wash their hands of the ecological and social dimensions of this. So we need to talk about, about that and not get swayed by the allure of green growth and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there for now in terms of my thoughts, and we can come back to some of the questions. Okay. 
Thank you very much, uh, Birsha. I think you um, mentioned really a lot of essential points there. And you too, uh, by the way, a nice challenge, I think, for Samantha later on radicalizing a little bit the just transition definition. I hope Samantha will go into that. Um, we'll come back, I think, also to the climate finance issue. I have a question on that later, but I'm not going to bring it up now. On the uh, coal transition, of course, it's interesting to see that maybe the North is now giving an example on how not to do it. If I look what is happening in Europe these days as a result of the crisis, the cost of living crisis, and Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands, um, Austria all go back to coal, opening the power plants that they closed some time ago, there is something wrong. I understand, of course, why they do it, because with the gas that Putin is not sending us anymore, they have a, a problem at their hands. But the thing is, we could have done this transition 10 years earlier, and then we would not have been in the shh that uh, <laughs> we're in now. So I think the South maybe might have something to, to learn from that example on how not to do it. Anyway, um, I, but with that in a way, also the coal issue, I think I made a little bit of a bridge to our next speaker, who is uh, Shrestha Banerjee, and uh, she's uh, joining us, I think, from, from India. She's director of Just Transition at iForest, and iForest is the International Forum for Environment, Sustainability and Technology. So Shrestha, for you, the floor for also about uh, eight, nine, seven minutes, whatever you want, a little bit that time. Okay, go ahead. Thanks, I, hope. Will. Um, I would have loved to be there, but unfortunately it didn't work out anyway. But thank you very much for uh, you know, inviting me at this platform uh, to share the thoughts. Uh, so uh, basically I would like to uh, start on from where you left about this entire international platform of global climate justice. Now the question, in fact, what happened in Glasgow was that, you know, it has been going on for a while, like the developing countries, particularly like India, who has a lesser, um, you know, responsibility of uh, climate change, climate concerns, because our per capita emissions are much lower and all that sorts. And that's the reason what India has now spoken in Glasgow is it we are not going to phase out but phase down finally the thing that has been agreed upon which is which is well understood because the kind of development pathway that we are envisioning in India uh, there is a lot of issues with still energy access jobs everything but at the same time there is a you know there is a reality in India's coal regions which needs to be factored in when we are talking of how long we can push away the energy transition and just transition. Now there is, because if we look into India's coal regions and these are well proven facts, statistics, as well as ground experience is that the coal economy has been in these regions for more than 100 years in some areas, 150 years. But what has not happened, it has not translated to the benefit of all. So it has benefited few, where it has benefited some of the industry, some of the key players, some of the businesses. But at the same time, there is a huge, there is a whole lot of people in these regions who are directly or indirectly earning from coal. And these are the people who have not benefited in the last hundred years or so, or these regions from this coal centric economy. And there are some very telling statistics which support that, such as if you look into the multidimensional poverty indicators of these regions, most of India's coal centric districts are worst off than rest of the country. In fact, on an average, uh, proportion of people under multidimensional suffering from multidimensional poverty or below poverty line is the MPI is 25%, below poverty line is much lesser. But in coal districts, you will find just the opposite. It's twice the India average, and there are more in very frequently, there are 40 to 45% percent people who are still below the poverty line. So what it says essentially, it's that delaying the process of just transition or delaying the process of energy transition is not necessarily going to help the people who have not benefited from the coal economy. Their situation is not going to change. And the worst is if it is pushed 
what you said, what we must learn from the global north, if it becomes sudden or if it becomes unplanned, India will become much worse off because our, you know, resilience of these areas, these are poor areas, they have poor infrastructure, there is no alternative economic opportunities much around this region. So any sudden transition will not, is not going to help. It is going to just put these regions into a spiraling poverty and this is going to make these peoples worse off. So from a local perspective, from a national interest as well for the international justice, what we really need to understand is that India does not necessarily, countries like India, have to move away from fossil fuel right away. But what is essential today is to start planning a transition. And this is what we need to be very clear about in our own national deliberations, national policies, subnational action plans, as well as when we take it to the international platform to discuss that we need to plan a transition which is now going to happen over the next 30 years. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But given the you know, people, the huge amount of people who are dependent, and I can come back to some of those statistics, we cannot start planning a transition after 15 years. And India is looking at a coal peak around 2030 to 2035 right now. We cannot start the process at 2035. What we need to start is the process now. And there is no harm in building a new economy because we know that India's uh, coal dependence, it's highly informal. In fact, if we look at the trend of the past 10 to 15 years of the coal industry and which is largely operated by public sector undertakings, they have stopped hiring. Essentially, the formal workforce in the coal industry, not formal, I would say the people who have departmental workforce with the coal PSUs are declining and steadily declining. What is increasing is the number of contractual workers who though are covered by some of the social benefits, but actually do not because they keep on changing contractual work. And then there is the whole amount of informal workers who are like particularly the daily wages. A huge number of them are migrant workers who are involved in the transportation sector. And who are there, you know, other laborers. And if you go into the some of the key coal regions of India, you have people who are part of the informal economy, not necessarily workers, such as you find coal gatherers and sellers, village mining, what is going and all of that stuff. Now, these are the people who need, for whom we need to build a new economy. And in the new economy, from labor perspective, what is most important is to ensure that how we can give them a new social contract. And this is the biggest thing that India has to address today. That not just creating green jobs or, um, you know, building a new economy, transitioning away from coal. But what <clears throat> India needs to think of just transition, it's not just a sectoral transition, but the framing of just transition for us, if we look into the historic injustice that defines just transition, the social exclusion phenomenon, the poverty in these regions, we really need to plan a broad-based socioeconomic transition. And in very precise way, we are very clear of it right now through our ongoing research at various levels, it, it must be planned as a development intervention and not just a job creation or job substitution or providing for certain amount of people. Because if we don't plan that, then the challenge will be that we cannot have everyone part of it. And I personally do not in any level think that is going to affect any way our development pathway, as I said, if we build a new economy, because the old economy is not benefiting everyone. And in today's world, if you want to benefit everyone, it is, we need to plan our economy. Of course, I agree that it cannot be just built around renewable. Now, that is a wrong debate for India, because the statistics are very clear. First of all, that the renewable energy jobs will not come in the coal regions. So we need to plan economy which is diverse and which can create a lot of jobs. So one of the biggest things that we are currently looking at is how to build the MSME sector, how to build other industries, and where do we build them? And I'll come to that. We were talking about land. Actually, the coal mining land, if you start planning it in a very proper way, 
uh, which we are working now, the coal land, the land with coal mining provides you the biggest opportunity to build this new economy. You don't have to go by land grab. You don't have to go by more social exclusion so much. You do not have to go by more exclusions, which has happened during industrialization earlier when coal mines came up or associated industries came up. So we have to factor in all this when we build the new economy. And that is the key thing I would say that we need to take care of. And I was putting some of the points together uh, for this because we need to address actually four things during the planning. Number one is we need to address the poverty and deprivation that cripples this region through proper investments and planning. Second thing, which is very poorly discussed in the just transition debate is the pollution burden, because it is not directly sometimes, you know, factored in as a cost. But the challenge is that this regions are extremely polluted, which also has inflicted on public health and which has reduced people's productivity and opportunities of earning and the health costs. So we need to account for the pollution burdens also in these regions and provide environmental justice. Third thing is we cannot afford more displacement in the new name of building new industries. So that's why I emphasize that we need to think of a way to use the land that is already available with coal mining, with available with thermal power plants, which is not huge, I would say, compared to mining, and how to repurpose this land to build the new economy. And the fourth thing is we can we need to have a system where we involve these people in the decision making process. And this is, I can say with all certainty, is going to be a very, very difficult process given the large amount of people who we have in this region, our governing system, sometimes it is very top down. And this is something for which we need labor law reforms. We need many reforms to integrate these people in the decision making process. And uh, this is where well, I'll stop because there are so many things I can keep on talking about, but I'll uh, take more as a conversation in the later half. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shrestha. I think that's really a fascinating account. And I think for us Northerners, um, a very good example of how the reality there in the global south in India, in this case, is, is sometimes completely different from all the stories we have on, on climate change or biodiversity or on equality on coal, et cetera, et cetera, here in, here in the West. By the way, um, I would like also to point out, we just we have, we have her, um, especially focused on India, but the ETOI just uh, published a uh, paper, a policy brief, just transition in the global south, which you can find over there. And this is focuses not only on, on, uh, on the South as such, but focuses especially on Latin America. Unfortunately, we didn't have any Latin America, especially, especially well, you have, we have you, but you're more of a Westerner already. But uh, <laughs> a, a, a perspective from Latin America in this paper is a very interesting, I think, point of, uh, which will um, be, be interesting for all those who are following this, this, this debate. Um, Last but not least, um, we are now going to the trade unions and normally we had two speakers. We were having Samantha and she's still she's still there. I can see her. We had Samantha Smith, but also Francis Dara. Unfortunately, Francis, who um, is Indian and is actually one of the general secretaries of one of the trade unions there, couldn't join us. Um, he had some illnesses in the family or something like that. So he's not there, but therefore Samantha has a little bit of more, more time uh, to, to reply to some of the stuff that she already heard. And I think also to come up with what the trade unions think about the, the global North, global South perspective on just transition and on a social climate justice. So uh, Samantha, the floor is yours for about 10 to 12 minutes. Okay. Thank you so much, Willie, and um, hello, everybody. Um, and my name is Sam Smith, and I'm the director of the Just Transition Center at the International Trade Union Confederation. We represent 200 million organized workers, uh, mostly formal, but some informal in 162 countries. And the Just Transition Center was set up actually as a response uh, to not only the Paris Agreement, but to the negotiation in the International Labor Organization of global guidelines on just transition. And maybe it's good to spend a moment on those uh, just so that we have a common starting point. 
So the ILO is the UN body with jurisdiction over issues relating to the world of work. It's the UN's only tripartite body with workers and our representatives, uh, unions, and uh, employers and their associations and governments. And the ILO had a multi-year process, including a convening an expert panel to come up with these guidelines on just transition and then finalize that negotiation prior to um, the negotiation around the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. The timing is kind of important because what we have is we have an architecture at the global level for just transition, as opposed to some statements in Glasgow most recently or in the COP in Warsaw and so on. So, um, so that, that was why uh, ITC established the Just Transition Center after a couple of decades of work. Trade unions had gotten what we wanted, which was uh, this, these guidelines from the ILO, uh, this emphasis on decent work in the SDGs, and then the Paris Agreement, which refers to the imperative of the just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs. So we looked around and we were like, wow, you know, we, we actually need to do this. And um, maybe it's also helpful to hear a bit about what trade unions, but also governments and even a few employers are doing on just transition. Um, so when I started five or six years ago, there was relatively little action on just transition, but now we're working with unions more or less evenly between the global South and the global North. On just transition, we work primarily with unions in uh, high emitting countries and high emitting sectors. We are starting to look at this intersection of just transition and adaptation. Um, and we have, you know, we have a few conclusions from this. Um, so one conclusion is that um, just transition is not just for the West or for the North. Um, one of the things that we committed to do was to work with our trade unions to come up with um, just transition in a way that is adapted to national or regional context, right? So we work closely with our regional centers in Asia Pacific and in Africa and in Latin America, and then with national confederations and also with sector confederations, especially but not only the energy sector, to work with them to come up with appropriate models of just transition for their situation. And I'll give you a few examples. In Brazil, you have a government that is incredibly hostile to organized labor and to trade unions. It's not as bad as it is in the Philippines or in India, but you have a government that is trying to strip away labor laws and also strip away environmental protections at the same time roll back the commitments that Brazil has made on climate issues. So what we have done together with, uh, with our affiliate Cuch Brazil and its affiliates is to work in the Northeastern states of Brazil, um, which are controlled by, by the Workers Party, a party favorable to labor, to set up a social dialogue platform between trade unions, uh, some employers and the state government to work on this issue of energy transition. Um, in South Africa, we have worked closely with the South African unions who have been at the forefront of developing this concept of just transition. They were in fact the first part of our movement to have positions on just transition and to develop that concept. So what has happened there is, as some of you know, is that the government of South Africa is um, on the top level has created a presidential coordinating commission on climate change where trade unions and others sit um, and has introduced a just transition framework. And that, um, and at the same time, the South African trade unions have prepared their own blueprint for just transition um, directed at policymakers, but also created with, you know, shop floor input from, from members, right? So they've had a series of meetings around the country with members from their different affiliates to get their input on just transition in the power sector and mining in transport and in agriculture. Um, 
So I would, uh, in addition to whatever is happening in the EU or in Canada and even now in the United States, in Australia, where after the election, we're going to see a big emphasis on just transition. I would just say that a lot is happening. Um, a lot is happening in terms of national legislation. A lot is happening at the regional and provincial level, which is a level where we also work. We have a cooperation with C40, the Global Organization of Cities. There are a lot of mayors who are interested in just transition. And looking across the trade union movement, I, I you know, feel pretty good about the movement as a whole because I feel that we, that we have actually worked hard over the last five to six years so that pretty much all parts of our movement understand that climate change is a thing and they understand what just transition is. I'd like to take this to a more practical level though because I'm not a researcher, right? I'm working with trade unions around the world along with the rest of the, rest of the team. Um, and the practical part of this is that uh, just transition is not something that's going to happen in the future. It's happening right this moment, especially for every single person who's working in the energy sector. So that would be point one. Point two would be that um, you know we're we're talking about this process of contractualization of jobs, for example, the jobs in coal in India, and and why are jobs you know the jobs are getting worse and more and more people are working informally. That is a willed process in a lot of countries, right? That's something that governments have done together with employers. They're making jobs worse for workers. And so it's not, it's not something that's happening sort of out, outside of us or it's kind of a law of nature. That is a process that we see across almost all economies, worse in the global South and made worse also by the behavior of multinational enterprises. I think um, a couple of other things to say about just transition. Willie, you challenged me about radicalizing the trade union movement conception. So not to be too much of a materialist, but in this context where jobs are getting worse, where people die at work on the regular, especially in the world's two, three most dangerous occupations, mining, construction, and agriculture, um, Working to make jobs better and to ensure that everyone has social protection, that people who today are working informally, whether in the care economy, where the women are subject to all kinds of exploitation and abuse, not just that our labor isn't recognized, or in coal, um, that, that, is actually, that is actually a pretty radical act, given the context in which we find ourselves. And the other thing is that our, you know, as ITC is a global organization, our affiliates have a range of political views, right? We have some affiliates, you know them in Europe. Uh, they are pretty conservative, let's say, on the issue of system change. We have other affiliates where that is their goal. They are social movement trade unions. Um, that's also their culture and tradition. There's a lot of that in Latin America, for example, but not only. And our job working in the trade union movement is to serve the working class and all of our members. And so that means that in a particular country, we're gonna be focused on what is what do our members and people should be our members want? Because that is trade union democracy. I think the last thing to say is about uh, just transition and climate justice. Like how do these two things work together? Um, at least, you know, I'll just give my personal view. Um, Climate justice is about the what. How quickly do emissions come down? Who pays? Who goes first? What about technology sharing? Um, what about paying for what about paying for loss and damage? Where is the climate finance? Just transition is about the how, and specifically about the how that relates to uh, the world of work, to jobs, and to social protection, and to other ways to make. Uh, the world of work and of social protection more inclusive. Just transition, uh, according to the ILO, to the United Nations, has gender equality as a sort of bearing principle. And in that context, I completely agree with what Isadora said. You have to look beyond this sort of one-to-one -one job replacement for, for people whose jobs might disappear in coal mining and coal-fired power. You have to look at how are we gonna make all the jobs good in a region? How are we gonna lift everyone's boats? What kind of social infrastructure and investment do you need in order to uh, make a coal region a place where people want to live and stay? I think though that the answer is probably not sending people back to the land because one of the things we do know about agricultural jobs 
is that in general, in almost every country, they are dangerous. They are very likely to be informal. And it's very hard to persuade somebody who today has a job with a contract, whether that is in coal mining or something else, to go to an informal job in agriculture. So if we're, if we're looking at regional redevelopment and agriculture as part of that, then we have to have much better jobs in agriculture and much stronger rights for people who are working in agriculture than we have right now. And that goes for pretty much every country. So thanks a lot. Happy to say more about, about all of these things. Okay, thank you very much, Samantha. I think uh, these are some, 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 some very good presentation there of what indeed the uh, International Trade Union uh, Confederation is do doing at, at the global level, north and south, to get uh, to get your act on these things uh, together and to to work to work hard to 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 get the uh, transition done uh, wherever it is it is needed and 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 at what kind of level it is needed. Um, I'm I'm now going to ask if some of the other um, um, panelists would like to respond to to Samantha if not um, then I will go to, to to the questions I had a few questions myself but I would like to make sure that the audience has lots of questions too and can pose them so maybe Kalina I'm going to ask you if you can first see online if there are any interesting questions then we'll go maybe to the room uh, to see if there are some questions there and if we have some more time, I still have one or two of myself, but I can keep them for later. So uh, Kalina, you're, you have the floor with some questions there. Uh, yes, and so actually, um, I'm going to use this chance also to, oh, sorry, sorry, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm going to use this opportunity also to ask uh, a question that I actually had as well. So the first question uh, is quite specific and it's um, specifically directed at Birsham. Uh, lucky you, <laughs> and actually ties in with the question that I had for you as well. And so the question is um, to let us know a bit more about the case of indigenous people in Mexico, Mexico against the EDF, which you mentioned, and how this is related to just transitions. So this is like a, a sort of specific question, but my broader question, and I have been asking myself this also in my own re research, is about the the role but also the limitations of litigation in terms of promoting just transition so we know that uh, there have been some key cases in terms of sort of climate change and climate change policy so agenda case of friends of the earth in the uk and many many other examples and so they have formed an important part of strategies to prompt um, governments to act but um, perhaps what are the limits of this strategy because of course the law uh, has limitations and since we're on the topic of law and um, asking you questions, I actually also wanted to ask you um, about your experience in, in climate negotiations, which I think you've also done before, and how um, power dynamics and inequalities in this process perhaps also end up being entrenched in the, in, in the outcomes of climate negotiations as well. Um, that's something that I find very interesting. So this is sort of one question specifically to what you just mentioned. And the other one, the other question is a bit more general. Let, let, Should I? Let, let us get let's yeah. get a few few questions together, and then you can uh, take your time to answer whatever question you want. But uh, try to keep it short so that we can have as many questions as possible. No. Should I? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, very br brief question um, from uh, the audience uh, online. Climate change mitigation and adaptation generate shifts in the economy. So, could you could we make choices? They steer the shifts in irrational ways, for example, by stimulating more low tech and geographically well spread solutions, rather than high tech and geographically concentrated solutions. So I think I think what 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 the um, the question is getting at is, you know, can we stimulate activity that generates jobs for more people in more places? And so I think here is an interesting question also about inequalities between certain regions and others, not necessarily just between the global south and north, but also within uh, the regions themselves. So this is the other question. I don't know if anybody would like to tackle that. Let, let me actually add just one point to, to, to the whole climate litigation uh, question, uh, because my question is more, is climate, although I'm a big, big fan of climate litigation, on the other hand, is it enough? Um, don't we need a complete paradigm change in international law to deal with some of the planetary issues that we are dealing with? I mean, you have a lot of uh, talks and there are some countries who already have taken steps in order to give nature rights, uh, et cetera, et cetera, give 
plants or trees or rivers mm -hmm. rights and they have countries that have been have been doing that so is is a paradigm change not something that is more important than just these litigation issues so that i throw that on the table and then we'll come back to some other questions so Bisha, that's a lot of stuff for you there try to keep it uh, within i would say five minutes sure yeah i'll come to the um <laughs> big challenge okay uh so firstly on um <clears throat> the first part on litigation um and how can i guess how can just transition litigation kind of be transformative or is it um and what is the role of litigation in a sense um i guess going back to kind of some of the basics around why climate lit why people brought climate litigation is to sort of uh, get over some of the impasse around um political inaction around climate change uh, so that that's one way of these strategic cases are basically the government's not doing anything let me go to the courts to try and uh get get something going um in, in in a lot of times it's the last resort in a way so in, in india is a good example of this where uh, litigation is just gen environmental litigation rights based litigation is just generally used as a way to prong the government or uh, prong something to be done in a sense because there's inaction from bureaucrats executive etc uh, so you have to keep taking case to court might get an order order doesn't get implemented you go back to court and so on. So it's just like another way of getting something done. Um, uh, the, ultimately, litigation is not an end in itself, right? Um, it's just a tool that is used. That's kind of what it is. Um, and it can backfire. Hence, strategic litigation has to be thought, thought out, etc. Uh, judges are not by inherently not the most radical people, mm. right? Conservative. <laughs> Uh, uh, more often not quite conservative people, um, but also um, come with their own uh, views on the world, etc. And uh, and you have to keep that in mind. Um, in terms of the uh, international climate negotiation question and power dynamics, uh, yeah, I mean that's a really interesting question. Um, there are obviously various uh i mean the power dynamics okay to give one small part of this um uh international climate change negotiations now are so massive right the paris agreement is huge you have the you know a huge hotel uh, or conference center rather with multiple rooms with multiple meetings uh which requires multiple levels of specialty one particular article in the paris agreement you'll have some person who knows everything inside out, different tracks of negotiation, etc. So you need, uh, you know, each country comes with, well, needs almost an army of, of negotiators, diplomats, lawyers, etc. So the EU has obviously huge amounts of uh, expertise on the ground, etc. Uh, there people have worked for, for, for years on it and so on. Um, but then a small country who might be very climate vulnerable will not have that kind of um, uh, will ha not have that kind of expertise resources to throw at at the Paris Agreement and so on. Uh, so might turn up with a couple of diplomats who may have recently got the job, who may have not had the expertise in that. Um, that's just painting one picture. But at a minimum, you might even have very experienced negotiators from some small countries who are incredibly amazing at the job that they do but they're structurally constrained by the fact that uh, it might only be a few of them working on it. So they can't be in three negotiation rooms at the same time and so on. Um, so those kind of uh, power dynamics are, are very prevalent. And that's uh, in terms of my own work, that, that was where um, I had gone involved with an NGO providing expertise to uh, legal expertise to uh, small island states and developing nations um, around this. To, so there are sort of uh, civil society actors that try and fill that gap, but that's one example of the kinds of structural constraints in those negotiations that uh, inhibit um, inhibit things progressing any faster or in more transformative ways. Uh, okay, paradigm change that requires another uh, yes. three day conference. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, sure, I think there are some great ideas out there in terms of huge paradigm change in international law. Uh, the, the problem sometimes is, uh, you know, we can talk about these, but how do we action them, etc. We can make small um, splinters at the system in different ways, and that's perhaps more, a more practical way of thinking about it. So in some contexts, rights of nature and things like that work. In some contexts, it, it doesn't perhaps work, and, and perhaps it, it creates more problems than it does. Um, 
than solutions. So, okay, thank you, Isadora or uh, Shrestha or um, Samantha. Please uh, sign if you give me a sign if you want to come in on some of the things on, or you wait for the next question. Uh, um, Isadora, you want to Maybe react to something? You can go Samantha and then I. Samantha, Samantha, yeah, Samantha first, huh. and then Isadora afterwards. Samantha. Okay, thank, thank, thanks, Isadora. Um, so, I, so maybe it's also good to tease out different issues. So we have uh, we have the rights of indigenous peoples, which are covered by a different ILO convention on the right, you know, the rights of traditional indigenous peoples, their rights to land, and whether or not those rights are sufficiently recognized by the government of Mexico and by multinational corporations who are coming in and building, building wind farms, right? Using a lease from the government. The, you know, the, there, there are two different ways to think about this. And I'm just gonna say this because it's really important, right? Just transition as a framework does not get you to a real recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples. It can be a way to bring in those rights for people to discuss them in a stakeholder process. But what you really need is you need a government that has adopted this convention, is enforcing it, and is having a process before it ever puts an area out to lease for wind production that takes into account or even negotiates where these wind areas are going to be with the people who hold the rights that is the, the tribes or indigenous peoples. So I think that's, that's, you know, that's one way to think about this, that maybe just transition, there are lots of things that are really important, but where just transition is not gonna get you the solution that you need, which is actually real recognition of the land and other traditional rights of indigenous peoples. And then the, the other thing to say about, you know, is litigation enough? What about other kinds of litigation on just transition? The trade union movement, we, we litigate and also have a regulatory and industrial action on issues related to just transition all the time. So when, you know, you're looking out the window uh, in Brussels this week and you're seeing uh, Belgium and Brussels like shut down because of mass industrial action strikes because people's uh, wages don't keep up with the cost of energy and other uh, and other costs of sort of basic basic needs, where you're seeing this not only in the global north but in the global south, that is also related to just transition because one of the principles of the ILO guidelines is that governments have to take steps to make sure that the the costs and burdens of, for example, the energy transition are fairly distributed, and we all know that inflation is regressive. And so you are seeing a reaction to that and demands for more action by government, uh, demands for multinationals to cough up some of their profits in the form of industrial actions. So that we litigation is good, industrial action is good, collective bargaining also another way to try to get just transition. And if my brother Francis Darrow were here, he would tell you that his union has negotiated with Coal India um, arranged first of all, uh, an arrangement on just transition with Coal India, but that they are also negotiating on behalf of contract workers and more broadly for all workers, formal and informal, who are working in the supply chain of Coal India. Okay, thank you, Samantha, good points there. Shrestha maybe first and then Isadora. Mm -hmm. We don't hear you. Micro. So, um, yeah, just just very briefly, you know, um, I think what Bilsam pointed out is right, that um, litigations cannot be an end in itself. And the reason I say it, because we have, see, just transition will for particularly developing countries like India and the population of the scale or, you know, the dependence of the scale. The, the question we are talking of is planning and fundamental question of justice, like exclusion, poverty, providing jobs, land rights, and all of this. Now, these are nothing new, and, and these are no new questions. Now we are talking it under the umbrella of climate justice, or we are talking in terms of possible. But the fundamental question what just transition has to address is not something very new. But 
the I think the just transitions provide us the opportunity to think it in a context of economic development where there is a clear attention and a clear pressure from all sides and the problem is being well recognized. But litigation will not solve this because there are a few questions. Number one is this kind of issues have faced challenges earlier for the fundamental reason because of access to justice. And I'm just giving you one example, like when extractive industries come up, there have been questions of you know, public consultations, there has been issues of rehabilitation and settlement of rights, project affected people, and there are laws which protects in some ways. But the problem is that it has not been implemented. And then some issues have been taken to courts. And we once researched a lot on the National Green Tribunal, which was set up in India to deal with a lot of these issues. Now, what has happened over time is people who are the worst affected or the poorest, they, do, they cannot have access to justice just because they can't have a lawyer and lawyers cannot provide for all of them. The courts are too far to reach. They do not know what to ask for. So litigation just cannot solve the problem. But what I feel law will have a big role to play on and we cannot, I don't think we cannot really belittle it, is we need some local level support system to make people understand some fundamental rights that they can secure. And that's where we need strengthening of local institutions and some processes where people can go to and get justice. Now, I'm not very sure that can be solved by litigation, but I personally feel that can be strengthened by better governance mechanisms and to help people to get that because the number of people who are going to seek this in the process is not going to be something less and they are not educated, they don't understand the law, so they don't know where to go to. So this is something I feel that we need to really be mindful of. The second thing, which was a different question, and I'll answer it very briefly, which about the low tech technological solutions. I, I feel that's a very important because we have been talking to many of the renewable energy, uh, you know, people who are promoting RE uh, businesses, even the industry departments, energy uh, departments of the government. And everyone is very clear that large scale industries is not going to, however green they are, they're not going to be the solution for just transition. What you really need is industries which are small scale and which can create a lot of jobs because you really need the jobs at the end of the day. So to, my answer to that question is yes, that is where you have to create. And that's why I was emphasizing on to use the land that is available with coal mining and build around it. Because it's not just coal, we need to understand some of the other sectors which are directly related to coal, which huge amount of informality, such as the brick sector, which is very poorly understood, which is one of the largest MSME sectors today is providing the largest amount of jobs in India in the MSME sector. So this is something which is going to be directly impacted by coal slowdown or coal closures or coal phase down. So we really need to think in that scale and not just think of one industry in the process when we think of job creation. Thank you very much, Shrestha. I think very good point there, there indeed too. And the, the issue of decentralizing our um, uh, energy systems, I think is a very, very important one. And at the ETY, and we have a researcher who is very much working on that. And uh, I think in the future, we will do even, even more on, on that. Uh, of course, this is more from a Global North perspective now, but I think we'll try to get also the uh, South dimension in, in, in there in his, in, in his work. Um, Isadora, on, on, the, on the climate litigation, and I would like to take another uh, topic, and therefore I will we'll turn to the, uh, to the room here for some other questions. But yeah, um, actually, I wanted to talk about some other issues regarding inequality in the climate negotiations um, and feud as a person who has been attending, uh, especially with uh, the Women and Gender Constituency, which is one of the groups that do advocacy in that space. I've also, um, I, I have some things to share with you which are very representative of how that space is highly unequal and representative of the global injustices we have in the world. Um, so basically, I think you all heard that le at last COP in Glasgow, um, the if, if the, the fossil fuel, um, lobby 
uh, people would make up a delegation, they would be actually the largest delegation attending that conference. And so this conflict of interest is so inherent to the process, which is incredible how this how the, 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 the sector that many of us are trying to um, address um, as the, the causes of the, of, the, of the crisis, how they have so much um, access and power to influence the process. And by influencing the process, I mean by also, they also take, uh, they appropriate, for example, the language of just transition by using it that in, in, in their marketplaces, in their strategies, in selling their, their solutions in that space indiscriminately. And, um, and so we've seen in that last COP that just transition was a big, big, um, yeah, it was a, a discourse that many were using in, in a way that not necessarily included equity or, you know, um, or the basic principles inside of it, gender equality, uh, redistribution of costs and benefits. And so um, it was gr it's great that, the, that this course is gaining momentum on just transition. Many sectors are um, participating in the debate and interested in it, but also there is this hijack of the agenda, I would say. And also, I mean, in terms of inequality of participation among delegations, it's not only the, the matter of resources uh, on how um, the, the, you know, the Northern delegations have much more means to go there and influence the process. But once um, the Global South, the, the small island states representatives get there, um, it's also it's also the case that media attention is still like reporting things in a in I wouldn't call it like in an unfair way, but it's still giving much more attention to to the to the side of those who have more uh, resources to influence, like the, the the delegations in that case. So in the case of of the the the, the polemics around a fossil fuel. Um, phase out in the very last days of COP, it was largely reported in the global north that it was a, a, something that the global south countries like China and India were like not trying to get there. But actually the negotiations and the behind the scenes told the story was very different, like they wanted more responsibility and more commitment from the, you know, the most historically um, responsible countries there to commit to a faster phase out. And so the story is not always told uh, also after, uh, not only within that context, but like the inequalities, they are reproduced all around. And last point I wanted to make, which I find very interesting, and I would love to hear more about, is that Samantha touched upon the issue of social protection, and this is also, and how this is included in the, in the, in the idea of just transition. And I've, I've read quite some, um, feminist pieces on just transition that advocate for, uh, for example, a social basic income for, um, for workers or for people, informal workers that would be directly and indirectly um, affected by the transition. And I think this can be a means to also um, to achieve uh, the fair just transition that we're talking about. That opens a big debate too. If you start yeah. talking about about, about uh, basic income, but one of one of the things I think I take from from you, which which I think is very important, is this fact that of course I, I, I focused on narratives at the beginning, but narratives can easily be captured also by those who are don't have the same interest as the trade unions or the people who are fighting for a, a better planet. Uh, so. It's not just about, we sometimes as progressives say, we need a new narrative. Yes, we need a new narrative, but we also need new power relations. And we need, I think, also better access, and I say that as a journalist, better access to the media, because the media play a very big role in this on how they actually uh, uh, translate some of the narratives that they then, then, then hear. Um, I'm going to take a, qu a few questions from the floor now. I thought there was a lady over there and I think Bela also wants to ask a question. So um, I, I take you first and uh, try to keep it short. And also in your interventions for the panelists, can't try to keep it short. We still have, I think like 20 minutes left. So let's make the best of it. So can you please say also who you are and who you represent? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So um, my name is Céline Régibault. I'm a master's student at Leiden University. 
and I'm researching this exact topic. So I have a question for Birsha. Um, so if we take the example of Shell that has been in court in the Netherlands over CO2 emissions, but then thereafter moved to the UK, their headquarters, because they didn't want to face uh, what, was, what happened in court. So how can we, on a legal ground, avoid those type of situations where companies just move their headquarters and they just find ways to just avoid what people really fought for because in the Netherlands people really put a lot of effort into bringing that case in court so how can we avoid those big companies to just get away with it okay thank you we're not going to respond immediately we'll, we'll take some questions Bela you had a question there so if you could get the mic <laughs> thank you uh yeah yes so one uh, reflecting on what uh, Willy said at the beginning, but also then, then Birsa was picking up. My impression is that there is a quite a big contradiction between the climate justice and so uh, and the just transition. So, uh, climate justice on the one hand, especially on the global perspective, we talk about loss of damage, climate finance, uh, and and also adaptation support. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, just transition is just about the process of, of mitigation and the effects of that, and that is, of course, uh, very much uh, dispersed. Uh, also, I would say that many just transition interpretations see the just in terms of slow, because you need time to adapt. Yeah? At the same time, especially for, for the global north, there is an imperative of, of radical and quick uh, decarbonization. Uh, I would add also to the litigation uh, the debate that if we would be really radical and, and, and paradigm change, uh, we would say that the global north and Europe, uh, if re uh, historical emissions are taken into account, has no carbon budget at all, nothing. It's depleted, yeah. So, uh, uh, which means that any emissions Europe as is producing in the future, uh, Europe should pay for that, yeah, into a fund, and this fund would do everything for the the global south, yeah. Uh, easy thing, but of course uh, not in practice. Uh, uh, concrete question then on on what you think would be fair and responsible mining. Because I mean, I mean, yes. there is a consensus okay. that that for a green transition, it's different questions already, Bill. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we don't have that much time. I would love to have two hours more, you know. Uh, otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Frank Lai, you still had a one, because one one of the things uh, just just to mention, we talk about just transition. Basically, what I see for the moment is unjust disruption. This is what I see in the world now, no, not, not really just transition. Maybe I'm a little bit too pessimistic, but I'll just throw it out there. Uh, Franklin. Yeah, Franklin, uh, education officer at the, at the ETI. I have a question for uh, Resta. Uh, you, you talk about the need to build a new, a new economy, in, particularly in India, but it could be the same in, in Africa in, or in the global south. So on the other hand, in these countries, we know that uh, informal economy plays a very important role when it comes to the, the incomes for people. So my question is to know, do you think that this new economy is necessarily a transition to the informal economy to a much more formal one? Okay. Um, so that's different questions. Who wants to, to start off? Shrestha, do you want to, to answer the last one first and then I'll go around to see with the others who wants to answer one? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think you have asked the most difficult question <laughs> to make sure that, you know, we don't end up with the same informality in the new economy. Now, that, that's why I was saying that just transition will require, you know, reforms at multiple levels. First of all, as much as we, it will require planning and investments, at the same time, we have been researching on what can be some of the obstacles, legal obstacles of just transition. And one of the simplest thing in India is that the labor laws are too weak. So it in fact makes very easy in terms of labor transition. But the problem is that it will also create the largest, um, I would say uh, there will be a lot of protests and all of that. Now the new economy when you are building, 
Now, see, there is one challenge today in coal regions, and I think that provides us an opportunity. No new industry wants to come and build in this new regions in a lot of ways because there is some amount of hostility, social alienation. Now, in this new economy, we can build a new economy with less informal workers if we strengthen our labor laws. And it, informality is not just because, you know, sometimes some things are not there. For example, I'm telling you, the contract workers who are there in the coal sector today all have pension benefits. But the reason they are not being able to avail many of that, and today contractual workers are a huge amount. Now, they are not being able to avail it because kind the, the time of contracts, they are given one year, two years, six month contracts. And the law requires you to be with one company for at least 10 years to avail those benefits. Now, here is the challenge. So I think there are some solutions that are at hand to reduce the informality in the new economy, depending on the duration of the contract you determine for these people. Instead of giving six month, one year contract, you give longer term contract, which will help to formalize some part. It will not provide for everyone, but it will provide. Now, the second thing about informality is maybe they not will all be formalized, but what we can ensure in the new economy at least is better wages. Because the biggest challenge with the informal sector today, and we did a comparison, a paper recently on comparing the wages, is that they get even half of what is a minimum wage. Now, this is something even without formalization, we can get in the new economy a better life at least you secure better wages you build social infrastructure in a way that they do not have to you know run for a health care or cannot get their uh, children educated or all of that sorts so these can be done even without formalization and give better life to the informal workers so to me these are some of the fundamental things which we can do now I am still skeptical about the entire formalization because one of the questions we had for Samantha also pointed out that the privatization has also created informality in some ways. And when we look at India or countries alike, the amount of costing that just transition will require investments, building, you have to have private players. We cannot do without private players. Public sector cannot take care of this. And this is the challenge we have to think through that how we make the private sector more responsible. And the biggest way that the private sector can be made responsible is to ensure that if they do not perform well, they cannot do business there in terms of labor. So we need to have this indirect reforms in the process to make sure to have less exploitation. That can be my response to yours. I'm not sure if I've answered all, but there is no clear solution to formalize everyone in the new economy. That's not possible. So Samantha, I will I will give you the floor at the end for for some reactions to to all the other um, points that have been 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 raised now. But uh, I also would like to bring in because we've talked about the, the the litigation, and you still might want to answer the question on on the shell issue. But there are two issues that I would also like to bring in, and I know we don't have the time, so I bring them in, and you decide yourself if you want to answer some of it or not. First of all, on, on financial support. You know, the whole issue about financial support for, for loss and, and damage, um, which is an interesting concept and lots of it's very controversial. And as you said, in Bonn, there was again a lot of uh, north south debate with no result at all. But is actually the, the financial support uh, and you need that for sure for for adaptation, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But is, is, is it enough? Is, is the south help even if we would come up with the 100 billion that we're talking about would that be enough or does the south need a new kind of development model uh a new kind of totally different system instead of maybe using the 100 billion then to just imitate what we did wrong here in in the west in terms of our uh, 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 modernism or or economic system and, and another point that i would like to bring in and i i don't even cannot even bring in the, the, the degrowth uh, debate, which, which will also be, uh, be very in interesting. But the thing is, the stronger green measures we take in Europe here, and in the States for that matter, um, do they all profit to the South? 
Probably not. They could actually be detrimental to the South. I mean, the whole question, I mean, and we had good news today that the Fit for 55 is finally agreed in, in the European Parliament. The Fit for 55 has, has one of the, it's a whole package. One of it, of course, is the, the carbon border mechanism. What would be, what will be the impact of the carbon border me uh, mechanism on the countries who want to trade from the global south to the global north? Very difficult question. What about biofuels policies? If we do more green stuff here, what will that have as an impact in, in, in the south? Um, take the question also of what is now called sometimes green extractivism, you know. We're going to use hydrogen in the future, much more green hydrogen. For that, we're looking at Africa. Okay, if we are going to use all the solar that Africa will develop over the years, but then we are going to steal it from them in order to actually have hydrogen for our um, cars or for our transport or for other things, well, um, then the Global South might actually not profit from it. And we are back to kind of neo-colonialism that we have seen in, in the 19th century. Just bringing this in, you don't have to answer that. We only have like five minutes, I think, left or 10 minutes. So um, maybe um, I, want, I want you to react to the Shell thing or to some of the issues that I've, I've uh, raised. And then I'll come to the, to the last intervention to Samantha. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, okay, I'll start with the shell question since that was a specific one. Uh, yeah, it's um, so I don't have the kind of a more technical answer. I mean, your question is how do we fight this, right? Um, in terms of companies moving around, etc. Um, there's been a long kind of history of, of um, uh, trying to fight companies uh, with their exploitative human rights and environmental. Um, practices going back to perhaps the most horrific one in Bhopal in India in the 80s um, and companies escaping from that and and shell um, the shell one you brought up but in the UK again they might try to move to the UK but the UK there's um, ongoing litigation against them there there's um, been some breakthroughs so there are positive news there's been breakthroughs around trying to pierce the corporate veil to hold um, uh, hold uh, companies to account um, as well as um, get companies so the the case of vedanta uh, who were operating in um, the niger delta um, through a subsidiary uh, they were successful at suing the parent company in the uk so there have been so, sort of breakthroughs in the last three four years around this um, and so the only way is to solve this is to continue to fight on all levels right that that's all you can kind of do there's no like one magic solution that can be drafted up um, the broader points. Okay, where do I start? Uh, the um, I, I I I completely I, I saw where you're going there with the climate justice just transition uh, kind of um, tensions around climate justice, mainly at the international level, talking about finance around adaptation and loss and damage. Just transition, talking perhaps the discourses more on mitigation in the global north at a national level. How do we kind of marry these two things up? Um, you know, uh, in some levels, this adaptation mitigation is an interesting one to think through. I mean, adaptation, for instance, uh, you still need some level of just transition to respond to it. I mean, areas which are getting um, affected by hurricanes, droughts, etc. Uh, people are losing jobs, etc. So you need to think through some sort of transition in, in a sense, right, in a just transition kind of discourse. So I think that needs to be this is why this kind of panel is trying to bring together these discourses rather than keep them separate um in a sense um okay uh i can't remember the question on finance and loss and damage except that i was going to say the hundred billion dollar uh point was um was kind of dreamt up in 2009 when it was uh when it was agreed as in like it just was it sounded nice so that was the figure given but it didn't mean that it was adequate in a sense, mm. um, but also it $100 billion a year, the word is mobilize. And um, that is a, you know, slightly vague word in a sense, right? It's not give $100 billion. So uh, there's been a lot of co financing, for instance, so let's say you're doing a project in Bangladesh, uh, you're you are giving the global north is let's say giving uh, eight, eight dollars, uh, and uh, the global south country has to come up with $2. And then you count $10 as mobilized, right? 
So it doesn't mean that there's a hundred billion dollars. Sometimes people think of it as a transfer or some sort of you know transaction. It's not like that. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, uh, watering, sort of muddying the waters through bringing in private actors to fill that hundred billion dollar commitment. So will more privatization in the global south be you know part of uh, climate finance and under this hundred billion dollars, um, you know, what we used to think as climate debt aid, etc., is actually just further privatization um, and so on. Uh, so there are all these questions that come up with this climate finance um, issue. Um, uh, I'll okay, D de degrowth and other questions. I'll no, no, no. This. <laughs> leave, leave that <laughs> next year. <laughs> Okay, um, you want to say something yeah, really quick? I, just to finish um, on, on maybe the growth. I don't know. I wanted to to connect many of the of the issues tackled here, but uh, but now it's just too much. And I think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say it's actually. I think the the biggest the biggest challenge maybe is not you know um, to learn how not to do things from Europe. I mean, we know that looking at colonial history that we don't we don't want to learn from here from europe how to do things um this has led to a lot of damage to a lot of racism around around the world which is still we see nowadays nowadays but i think um i think the challenge is indeed to re to transform all those systems that belong together that make people you know in in less um well that oppress people um and i'm talking about um, and how they are interconnected. And I'm talking about Patrick, I'm talking about racism, I'm talking about um, the divisions between uh, informal and former workers. So um, many things that should ha have to be addressed uh, in a systemic way uh, so that we can, um, that we, yeah, because also now that we're talking about the growth uh, exponentially in the global north, um, the idea is not that that we catch up and that we would have to in in at some point transform and not consume so much anymore right so um we need this system change as we as we much claim for anyways thank you for the opportunity and i hope yeah galina short short and then samantha uh yes really short i actually just wanted to pick up on something that both samantha uh, and bella and Biesch actually just addressed which is you know this question of or the, the the connection or maybe the conflict between just transition and global climate justice and I think Beda and Samantha both pointed out that you know there's this sort of two different levels and Samantha I think put it nicely about climate justice is about the what and just transitions is about the how but I think you know maybe part of the reason why we wanted, wanted to bring these two concepts together is because they fundamentally sort of level of abstraction they deal with similar questions right they deal with they ask you know who is affected who is most affected how do we redistribute risks um uh and benefits how do we protect how do we ensure that people aren't left behind um you know this we, we spoke about the gender equality perspective and so on and so i think there's really a lot of scope to learn from uh really from people who have worked in just transitions such as Samantha, you know, also someone coming from more of a climate justice background, such as Isadora and also Birsha from different perspectives. And I think it's really, it's really important that we sit here together coming, um, coming from these different backgrounds and try and put our thoughts and our ambitions uh, and, and goals together, because I think we share a lot of those. Uh, and so this is kind of why we, we tried to sort of start this conversation uh, and I don't know how, how far we got with it, but I think we, we, I, hopefully there's some food for thought there. So I just wanted to say that as clarifying the, the focus of the panel. So it's a very good conclusion in a way uh, already, Kalina, but I'm still going <laughs> to give the floor to Samantha. Samantha, so you have a few minutes. Yes, left. well, you know, trade unions, we love to have the last word. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that, Willie. Um, so I, I guess, first of all, I, you know, just, I would just say also somebody who has worked in the climate movement and would consider myself a climate activist, I don't really see a conflict between climate justice and just transition. When we see these conflicts between acting on climate and the rights of workers, we have to ask ourselves who is benefiting from those conflicts, right? So, and we see those conflicts all around us, right? If the, you know, the components of renewable energy are made with forced labor, for example, or if rare earths are being mined by, by children you know, working with toxic substances. Who is benefiting from a conflict about whether these things are okay? It's definitely not workers. And I would also just say that anyone who is 
you know, selling, if you're selling your labor for wages, you're a worker and you're not necessarily uh, the person who has the power to decide whether or not climate action goes forward at the right pace. Um, and you also aren't necessarily able to decide by yourself whether or not you're gonna get a just transition. That's only something we can do as workers through collective action, using these tools and institutions like social dialogue and collective bargaining and all of the sort of infrastructure of rights that we have fought for, for you know, <laughs> decades. And so that's, that's one thought about, is there a conflict? And if there is a conflict, like whose conflict is it and why does it exist? I think the, the other thing to say about, um, about where's the money, right? Because that is an important question for just transition. Just transition rests on fair tax. So again, um, instead of sort of looking at the, you know, what a government will say, which is we don't have enough money to do X, Y, and Z. What we can look at is what has happened, for example, in response to COVID where Northern governments had plenty of money, um, much of it like wisely spent to help keep foreign working class households in their countries afloat um, in Europe to keep people on furlough. There was a ton of money. The state was suddenly very big because it was a crisis. And the other thing that we see now because of the, of the war of aggression in Ukraine is that Western governments have unlimited amounts of money to remilitarize, right? So they're going, going to get to the next round of climate negotiations and be like, well, you know, <laughs> it's even it's not just that we're going to mobilize this money, but also like we've had to respond to, you know, we're putting money into, into the military right now. So we don't have enough money necessarily for climate action. Um, so I would just like to urge us all to contest what we are told about, like, where is the money and why isn't there enough money for this? Because the money is there. The money is there in all countries but it is, uh, it is not necessarily being recovered through fair and appropriate tax. And that includes fair and appropriate tax on multinationals. Um, so here are a few sort of concrete things that we at least would like to see that might help to get a, a just transition for more people. And these are things that can be done from within the European Union, because Willie, you started out with this idea of like what's going on in Europe, is that really gonna lead to a just transition for others? So one is that there is a pending regulation in the EU requiring European multinationals to have human rights due diligence throughout their supply chains. And you know the current draft is weak, we're not happy with it, we think that this should be a strong and binding regulation. And I can just say that any company that can tell you what emissions they have in their supply chain, they can also tell you whether human rights are being violated in that supply chain, right? That's not happening because they don't wanna do it. And because as a couple of people have said, our model is, is built in fact on human rights violations for workers in the <laughs> supply chain. The second thing is that, um, in terms, of, in terms of a new development model or uh, versus climate finance, you know, the thing with international negotiations is you commit to stuff and then you should deliver. And in fact, uh, developing countries traded away some things in the climate negotiations in order to get that 100 billion US per year commitment. So it, I don't think it's, a, it's, it's good practice. It definitely doesn't strengthen international processes to uh, make a commitment and back away from it. And the third thing is that we are talking about a process. So indeed, perhaps not all formal jobs that exist today can be made formal in any country, including European countries. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing our very best to make it happen as activists, um, as people who are committed to human rights, and also as people who are committed to action on climate. Um, measures to increase the coverage of social protection also to people who are working informally would be really welcome. We, ITUC, have called for a global fund on social protection for the lowest income countries because they are probably not going to be able right now to generate the funds for social protection. And the last thing is, uh, is that the you know, we have, we have standards for decent work. This is kind of the backbone of just transition. And so if we were trying to implement those standards, not only through 
multinational enterprises, but also through foreign policy, through trade policy, through investment, um, we would certainly get a lot further in getting a just transition or supporting a just transition for others than, than, than we have today. So I'll stop there. I want to thank you for an interesting discussion and uh, yeah, see what happens next. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's not, it's not the last word. I have the last <laughs> word as the moderator. So, But I use that last word to thank some people because I first would like to thank the ETUI and Nicola for giving us the possibility, Kalina and I, to really take the framing of the North-South debate uh, in, a, in a discussion on, on inequality. It's such an important topic. And I feel I, I moderate a lot of debates in Brussels, and I've done that for the last 20 years. And a lot of these EU debates are very interesting, but they're very white, they're very patriarchal, there is no feminist view, there is no such view, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think by that, I think I'm very, very happy with this discussion. I would have wished that we would have uh, one hour more at least. But I will conclude with two, uh, with one phrase and then one point that, uh, that I would still like to make. Um, we always say the social ecological transition will be just or it will not be. I would add to that the social trans the just transition will be global or it will not be. So I think that's an important point that I want to make. And then last but not least, I talked about power, I talked about narratives, and I talked about um, um, a few other issues. But what we need very, very, very much is imagination. <laughs> I think we actually are not very good at imagining the new world that we want to live in. And I was not somebody who was always very interested in this debate about colonialism, but there is one author, Indian author, who actually pointed me to this because I'm a very big uh, reader of novels. And that uh, Indian uh, author is Amit Amitav Ghosh. Amitav Ghosh has a book called The, the Nutmeg's Curse. And it's about how colonialism historically created the world that we live in and the problems that we live in. So if you need any literature for your holidays, that's what I would recommend. And with this, I really end now. And thank very much to all the panelists. Thank you very much, Samantha. Thank you very much, Shrestha, Birsha, and Isadora. And of course, Kalina, without her help, this I would not have happened. So very many, many thanks uh, to you also. And Thank to you. you. <laughs> <laughs>